Well, good morning. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Greetings from the sanctuary of Rock Lake United Methodist Church. I'm glad you're here. Glad that we can be together even if in this fashion, but this too will change. Even now our churches are working at planning on how they can Restart worship. Kandu will begin in-person worship on June 7th. And Rock Lake and Rolla, as of the time of this message being recorded, have not yet made that decision or picked a date, but it's going to happen. We will get together. But until that time, and even after that time, I'll continue to do these messages. So we'll be able to be together. Will you pray with me? Glorious God, author of life, Come to us as we come to you, confessing our sins, our fears, our hopes, and our needs. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and fill each of us to the full. This we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The scripture that I'm going to share with you today, or scriptures, are the scripture passages selected by the lectionary for today, Pentecost Sunday. So we will visit the second chapter of Acts, verses 1 through 21, as well as a short passage from the Gospel of John in the seventh chapter. Hear now the word of our Lord from Acts, chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya, belonging to Serene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, in our own languages we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it's only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, shall be saved. Hear now the good news from the Gospel of John, 7th chapter, beginning at the 37th verse. On the last and most important day of the festival, Jesus stood up and shouted, All who are thirsty should come to me, all who believe in me should drink. As the scripture said concerning me, rivers of living water will flow out from within him, Jesus said this concerning the Spirit. Those who believed in him would soon receive the Spirit, but they hadn't experienced the Spirit yet, since Jesus hadn't yet been glorified. 
this is the word of God for the people of God. Will you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, it's Pentecost Sunday. It's that Sunday that we celebrate each and every year. It's a date that, that a good many people consider to be kind of like, well, it's the birth date of the Christian church. That's when it started, sort of. So it's right that we celebrate, and it's also right that we really should revisit this familiar story of Pentecost each and every year. It's good that we visit it over and over again, because in this Pentecost story, as is the case with so many of the stories in our Bible, there's just so much for us to take in, more so than perhaps really cap captures our attention in just a quick reading. Sometimes we get so enthralled with, with one aspect that we overlook other things, even, even things that are important. And this is a prime case in point. In this Pentecost story, we oftentimes get caught up in, in, in either the imagery that, that Luke uses to describe the arrival of the Holy Spirit, right? And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. It's important to note that there are wasn't actually a violent wind in that room, but rather there was something that sounded like a violent wind that they heard. It was something powerful, all but overwhelming. And actual flames did not appear and rest on the people in that room, but rather something that appeared to be like fire was there. It's another brilliant, really a tension-grabbing, tension mind-boggling display of power. Or, once we get past all of our amazement and confusion about just what the sudden appearance of the Holy Spirit really looked and sounded like, we often kind of skip on to the next thing. And that's the amazing news that the people who had been given the Holy Spirit were suddenly and inexplicably able to speak in languages that enabled all of the surrounding people to hear the good news, each in their own languages. We can't explain how all of that happened, but we do find it pretty cool that it did happen. It's Pentecost story. But if we stop with just those things, just the dazzling sights and the sound of, of Pentecost, the linguistic miracle, as amazing as they are, we miss something else. We miss something important. Really, it's true. Because what we miss, if we just stop at the sights and the sounds and the languages of Pentecost, what we miss is us, you and me. And yes, I know full well that you and I weren't physically present in Jerusalem almost 2,000 years ago. So let me explain what I'm talking about. And first, I want us to take a look at the people who actually were in that room so, so many years ago. Just who were those people? By the time of Pentecost, Luke notes that the family of believers was a company of about 120 persons. So there could have been as many as 120 people or so, possibly including all 12 of the apostles, because by now Judas's position had been filled by another follower of Jesus, and they were all together in that room. So somewhere around 120 people could have been there. Okay. But who were these people? I mean, really. Were they some sort of super-duper Christians? Were they somehow superior to the other people of their day? Absolutely not. We need to realize that the people in that room were far from perfect. They were far from super. In fact, all of them were broken to some extent. You know, typically Peter gets all of the bad press for his denials of Jesus, but the truth is that all of the other people People in that place, each and every single one of them, each of them in their own way, either explicitly or implicitly denied Jesus Christ. Not so much as a single one of them 
defended Jesus after his arrest. None of them defended Jesus during his trial. None of them came to his aid when he was being crucified. They had all abandoned Jesus to suffer and die up on that awful cross. Broken, imperfect people, every last one of them. And yet, there they were. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. Okay, so now we have 120 or so broken and imperfect people gathered all together in one place. But why were they there? Since Luke doesn't say that, that any of them were being held captive in that room, well, we can safely assume that they were there because they all wanted to be there. But why? Why did they want to be there? Well, think back. Think back to the end of Luke's gospel account, the one that we visited last week when Jesus ascended up into heaven. And those last words from Jesus that Luke records in his account, those who followed Jesus were told, look, I'm sending to you what my father promised, but you are to stay in the city until you have been furnished with heavenly power. All of the people in that room were where they were because they wanted to receive what God had promised to them. They somehow understood that they didn't have enough on their own to meet their needs. They somehow understood that they needed whatever it was that God had to offer them. That's why they were there. The people who were not interested in receiving what God had promised had most likely already left the building, left the town, went somewhere else and were living out their lives, wherever that was. But these other people gathered. Broken, imperfect people gathered there waiting for God to give them what they needed. Well, among the good news items for us to remember and celebrate today is that God was true to his word. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, as Luke says. All of them. All of them. Even the most imperfect, made a total mess out of their life person in that room, nonetheless received the full measure of God's redemption deeming life-transforming grace through the gift of God's Holy Spirit that came into them and immediately changed their lives. And that is what happened in Jerusalem almost 2,000 years ago. And those really were the people of whom we generally think when we think of the people of Pentecost. But we need to realize that they're not the only people of Pentecost, they have company. Because you see, the people, the imperfect, broken, and subsequently redeemed people of Pentecost also includes us. You and me. Really, it's true. Think about it for just a moment. Think about who we are. Think about what we are. Every single one of us, every single one of you, myself included, is imperfect. All of us have been broken, to some extent or another, by our human sin. And all of us, each of us in our own way, in our own timing, have denied Jesus Christ by failing to willingly minister to the very least of society with whom Jesus self-identifies. We have not cared for the homeless, the prisoners, the sick, the immigrants, or the outcasts of society to the extent that we could if we just set our hearts and minds to that task. At the very least, we have ignored the pain of those who, who somehow don't fit into society's fickle notion of, of what is normal. And at times, 
even if only in the silence of our private thoughts, we've called them names. Call them names that seek to dehumanize them in order to justify to ourselves the mistreatment that so many of our neighbors continue to suffer. We are all alike broken by human sin, just like those folks in Jerusalem all of those years ago. But there's more. There's more. Remember, the people in that room in Jerusalem were there because they wanted to be there. They wanted to be there because they knew that they needed more than they could provide for themselves, and they really did want what God promised to give to them. That's why they were there. Okay. Each of us, all of us, all of you who can see my face right now, who can hear my voice, are where you are. And you are paying attention to what I am saying. And you are doing that because you want to be doing that. Nobody can force you to pay attention. See, this is a deliberate act on your part. And why do you want to be here? Wherever here, physically, emotionally, spiritually, happens to be for you. You are where you are, watching and listening to this video because you, even if you can't put it into the words, nonetheless, at some basic, perhaps even indescribable level, know that you want, that you need what God has to give to you. You feel a lack and you know that God can meet that need. Well, the really neat thing is that God will give you what you need. He will. Nobody gets left out. Every person who comes to God seeking what God has to offer them receives it, and they get it in its fullest measure. Right? Remember what Luke tells us. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. God's indwelling presence in its fullest possible measure is given to you. You. Yeah. Yeah. Even you. Even you. As fault riddled as you may happen to be, as unworthy of love as you may erroneously deem yourself to be, even and especially you, just as you are right here, Right now, you are given the gift of God's Holy Spirit. God gives it to you because he wants to give it to you. Your past does not matter to God. You matter to God. And God loves you. And because God loves you, God comes to you. He takes the initiative and comes to you through his Holy Spirit and makes it possible for you to be with him all of the time, for all time. In our gospel lesson today, Jesus, speaking to the people of God, and that includes you, he says, all who are thirsty should come to me. All who believe in me should drink. As the scripture said concerning me, rivers of living water will flow out from him. This living water that Jesus speaks of is everlasting life. Jesus offers and Jesus will give that everlasting life to all who come to him in faith. And that, that includes you. You are here. Wherever here is for you. Because you want to be here and you want to receive what God has to offer. Know that God gives that to you. He does right here, right now, in its fullest possible measure. God gives to you his Holy Spirit 
And with that gift, you receive God's indwelling presence. That means God is with you. God is living in you through his Holy Spirit that's going to comfort you. It's going to guide you. It's going to strengthen you on your journey in faith. And this is a journey that will, through the grace and power of our almighty God, bring you through the trials of earthly life so that you can be at the side of our almighty and gracious God where you will dwell in perfect peace for all of the days that are to come. Brothers and sisters, yes, it's Pentecost Sunday. Celebrate the day. Celebrate the people of Pentecost because you are one of them. Blessed with all of the glorious and unending future that God has prepared for you. Praise be to God. Amen. Will you pray with me? Almighty and gracious God, we come to you on this special day confessing that it's true. We can't provide for ourselves everything that we need all by ourselves. There is, in fact, a void within us, an empty space that only you can fill. We pray that you would give to us that without which we cannot live, the life-changing, life-giving gift of your Holy Spirit. Fill us with such faith in you that we can eagerly and joyously share your love in the world that is around us. Heavenly Father, we come to you today, praying not just for ourselves, but for our neighbors, for all of them. We pray for those who are mourning the death of a loved one. They need your help. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon them to give them the, the strength, the faith, the hope that they need in this very difficult time in their lives. And it is a difficult time for so many of our neighbors. We acknowledge that we live in a time when so many are struggling with loss in so many different ways. The loss of a relationship, the loss of the job, the loss of self-esteem, the loss of familiar and loved routines, the loss of hope. Help us to be those beacons that can shine the life-giving, life-changing light of your love and grace into the world around us to comfort our neighbors. And in this time of social distancing and forced isolation, we pray for your comfort to speed to those who cannot enjoy visits with their loved ones. And this is a difficult time, O oh God. In this time of anxious anguish and, and anger, of violence and destruction, we pray for peace. We pray for understanding of the anguish and the fears of our neighbors. We pray for compassion rather than prejudice and anger. Most gracious Lord, even as we ask all of these things of you, we affirm that we are truly thankful for all of the answered prayers, all of those joy-filled moments that you continue to bring into our lives. You truly are the author of all that we hold dear, and we are grateful for your generosity, as well as your boundless and redeeming grace. We are your grateful people. And all of this we bring to you today in the name of our Savior Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now, my brothers and sisters, as we prepare to leave this virtual time together, to, to go forth into our worlds, let's pray about that in our prayer for going forth. Creator, Redeemer God, be with me as I go out into the world. Open my eyes and my heart to the opportunities that you provide for me to serve you and to love my neighbors. Daily, give me the wisdom and courage that I need to be an effective servant in Jesus' name. Amen. And now, my brothers and sisters, fellow Pentecost people, go in grace and peace.